This is the fifth and final part of the lecture on imaging of the paranasal sinuses. We have just a few cleanup topics like differential diagnoses and fibrosseous lesions. Fibrosseous lesions of the sinonasal cavity can be very confusing, in part because they look a lot alike, although you can usually tell them apart. The other reason is that it's a bit of a word salad. They all sound the same. Fibrous osteoma, ostifying fibroma, fibrous dysplasia, those sound a lot alike, but they're really different things, and, um, and you can distinguish these things radiologically. Osteomas are bony exostoses that come off of an underlying bone. When an osteoma occurs inside a bone, when it's an enostosis, we call that a bone island. When it extends outside of a bone into an air cell or into surrounding soft tissues, we call that an osteoma. There are two basic types of osteoma that affect the paranasal sinuses, ivory osteomas and fibrous osteomas. Ivory osteomas are what you're probably used to. They are composed of dense cortical bone, the whole thing, just dense cortical bone, here seen filling uh, a frontal sinus. The other form of osteoma is a fibrous osteoma, and they often come in, in mixed forms, as in this example. You can see the ivory osteoma along this surface, but most of this osteoma actually has this heterogeneous look to it, maybe even a ground glass look to it. This is a fibrous form of osteoma. Right? Not everything that you see with, with this degree of density uh, falls into the other categories. This is actually an osteoma, just a different type of osteoma. Fibrous dysplasia is what is the disease that classically is described as a ground glass density. And this is what we're talking about. This is the density that has been likened to the ground glass that you see on shower doors and such. The key thing about fibrous dysplasia is that it is expansion of an underlying bone, and that bone expands but retains its normal configuration. This is the anterior clinoid process on the left. This fibrous dysplasia lesion still has the same configuration as the anterior clinoid process. This is fibrous dysplasia within the anterior clinoid process. You can still see walls of the sinus and roof of the sinus in this area of dys fibrous dysplasia. It retains its normal configuration. The reason we care so much about fibrous dysplasia in the skull base is the, its effect on the foramina. You can see the optic canal here is not happy as it is surrounded by dysplastic bone. Okay, but the key here, fibrous dysplasia retains the configuration. It expands, but it retains the configuration of the underlying bone. Another thing to remember about fibrous dysplasia is that it doesn't always look like a ground glass opacification. There are three radiologic forms of fibrous dysplasia. Ground glass is the most common, but there is also a cystic form of fibrous dysplasia, and there is a pagetoid form of fibrous dysplasia. The cystic form has large cystic areas that, that without density, and the pagetoid form looks like Paget's disease. These are often intermixed in single lesions that have any or all of these forms, these radiologic forms in combination. At first glance, this looks a lot like fibrous dysplasia. There is ground glass opacity. It's well-defined, very benign looking. But remember what we were talking about when we talked about the configuration of fibrous dysplasia. It has the configuration of the underlying bone. This is lobular, spherical, right? That is characteristic of an ossifying fibroma. And this is how we distinguish between fibrous dysplasia and ossifying fibromas. Ossifying fibromas may sometimes have a characteristic stellate pattern of calcification, so you can really clinch the diagnosis, but they don't have to. The configuration is the key. This distinction is particularly important for radiologists because pathologists often cannot tell the difference between an ossifying fibroma and fibrous dysplasia. I will get telephone calls from my pathologist saying, I think it's one of these two. What does it look like radiologically? And this configuration is what will allow us to make the distinction between fibrous dysplasia and an ossifying fibroma.
So here's another example to drive home this concept of whether we're dealing with fibrous dysplasia or ossifying fibroma. The, here is a ground glass lesion, right? It's sitting along the anterior aspect of the, of the clivus or maybe coming from a wall of the sphenoid sinus, however you want to look at that. So what's the configuration? Is this the configuration of an underlying bone or is this a spherical configuration? This is almost perfect with sphere, perfectly rounded. This is an ossifying fibroma, not a fibrous, not fibrous dysplasia, no matter what the pathologist says. There is a form of ossifying fibroma that occurs in children and is substantially more aggressive. This is the juvenile ossifying fibroma. It usually destroys the underlying bone, spreads in all directions. It has a very high recurrence rate, and it is often more heterogeneous in its appearance than most ossifying fibromas that tend to stick with a ground glass or cystic appearance. So juvenile ossifying fibroma, really a distinct entity, much more aggressive than its adult counterpart. Fibrous dysplasia and ossifying fibromas can be very confusing on MRI. They can look very aggressive. They can have cystic areas with weird enhancement patterns. Often it's not until you see the CT that you can make the diagnosis of fibrous dysplasia. This is a favorite boards question because it can look very aggressive and everyone thinks about an aggressive tumor and everyone's going down this very aggressive pathway, but it's a benign entity and the CT is easy as slam dunk. Paget's disease, although it is renowned for affecting the calvarium, can also extend into or primarily affect the sinonasal region. Paget's disease is characterized by a thickening cortex and an enlarged abnormal medullary cavity. There are often cystic areas as well. Don't forget that fibrous dysplasia can mimic Paget's disease. Usually the age of the patient is a good clue there. Inspissated and trapped secretions within the nasal cavity can sometimes calcify and form what we call a rhinolith. These tend to have dense calcifications around the periphery and occur in characteristic locations in the anterior nasal vault. There are several surgeries of the paranasal sinuses that are worth knowing about, and it's worth knowing the radiologic findings of those surgeries so you know when they are expected findings. The most common surgery that we encounter is functional endoscopic sinus surgery, or FES. Occasionally, you'll still see residua of the old caldwell luck procedures, and sometimes you'll run into a sinus lift operation. A FES, or a functional endoscopic sinus surgery, is the most common way of performing surgery on the paranasal sinuses. Now, FES is not to be confused with FES, the fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. This is a FES. In a FES, anatomic elements of the nasal cavity are removed in a particular order to try and improve the drainage pathways of the sinuses. The first thing to go is the uncinate process, an uncinectomy. Once that's been performed frequently, the base is also taken off. This media, portion of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus comes with it, and that's an antrotomy. Some people like the term antrostomy, but there's no tube involved, so it's an antrotomy. If you want to go a little bit further, you can start to take out the walls of the ethmoid aerosols. You can either do a partial or complete ethmoidectomy. If the frontal sinus or sphenoid sinus is obstructed, you can open those up doing a frontal osteotomy or a sphenoid osteotomy. Those come a la carte. You don't have to do those. If you want to take it a step further, you can take out the middle turbinate or even the inferior turbinate, either partially or completely, to make more room. If you really want to get extreme, you can take out this portion of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus and form an antro-nasal window. That's the most extreme aspect of a FES is the antro-nasal window. Now you're probably asking yourself, why don't we just take it all off? Why don't we strip all of the mucosa all the way around the uh, nasal cavity and all of the paranasal sinuses and just get rid of it? If you do that, 
you get something called the empty nose syndrome. It turns out that your sensation of breathing depends upon the rush of air across the mucosa of your nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses. If you take out that mucosa, you can't tell you that you're breathing. The Air still goes in and out, but there's no sensation that you are breathing. This is extremely disturbing to patients. It's called the empty nose syndrome, and that's why we only take out what we have to when performing functional endoscopic sinus surgery. The Caldwell Luck procedure is a historical procedure that preceded the functional endoscopic sinus surgery when we didn't have endoscopes. It's still occasionally performed for tumor access, but usually not for sinusitis. In the Caldwell Luck procedure, a small gap is made under the gum line into the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus, and from there additional work can be done. But it's this gap in the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus that lets you know that a Caldwell Luck operation has been performed. Usually you only see this in elderly patients because younger patients would have gotten a functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Another procedure that you may encounter is called the sinus lift operation. If you want to put in dental implants, you need to make sure that there is a sufficient thickness of the maxillary alveolus in order to anchor those implants. You usually need about a centimeter thickness of the alveolus. If you don't have enough bone there, what you can do is do an operation where you lift up the sinus mucosa, stuff some bone graft underneath it, and then lay the mucosa back down on top of that grafted bone. The bone will mature in this location. It will artificially increase the thickness of the alveolus, and now you can put your dental implant in. Here's what that mature bone looks like on an axial image. This is mature incorporated bone. Here's what it looks like on the coronal image, and you can see how it's thickened the uh, alveolar ridge here to incorporate and allow for that dental implant. Now that we've covered the spectrum of pathology that we frequently encounter in the paranasal sinuses, let's talk about some useful differential diagnoses. What happens when we see radiodense material within the sinuses? What could cause radiodense material? Polyps can be radiodense. Sometimes you have radiodense polyps and radiolucent mucosa. Sometimes you have uh, more radiodense mucosa and radiolucent polyps. But polyps can inspissate and become radiodense. Inspissated secretions. Any long term entrapped secretions will lose their water content and become more dense. And then fungal infection. We've talked about how any of the forms of fungal infection share increased radiodensity. Here's an example of radiodense polyps interspersed with mucosal thickening that is not as dense as the, as the polyps themselves. Not all polyps are dense, some polyps are dense. Inspissated secretions. This happens to be a patient with cystic fibrosis who can't clear mucus, and this doesn't necessarily mean fungal superinfection. We're worried about that in these patients, particularly uh, patients who have undergone transplant for their cystic fibrosis and uh, are immunocompromised. We're really worried about fungal superinfection in those patients because it can be a, an aggressive invasive fungal sinusitis. But these patients often just have long-term inspissated secretions that are intrinsically radiodense. As we've talked about previously, all of the forms of fungal sinusitis can have radiodense secretions. This example I picked happens to be allergic fungal sinusitis, but um, invasive and fungal sinusitis and mycetomas can also have increased intrinsic radiodensity. Okay, new differential, septal erosions. Now, when I'm talking about septal erosions, I'm talking about without a mass. Obviously, if you have one of those aggressive neoplasms that we already discussed, it can erode through the septum and destroy it. But this differential is designed for when we see a hole in the septum and there's no mass to explain it. Probably the most common cause of septal erosion is prior surgery. Whether it's surgery on the septum itself or some other functional endoscopic sinus surgery, you can still end up with either intentional or inadvertent holes in the septum. Famously, cocaine causes septal erosions. Cocaine is a sympathomimetic, a vasoconstrictor, and that arterial constriction can result in necrosis of the mucosa overlying the septum and then the underlying bone erodes. Wegner's granulomatosis is another famous disease that can cause septal erosions or erosions of the other nasal contents. 
Um, the preferred name nowadays is granulomatosis with polyangiitis, but I think you'll find most people still refer to it as Wegener's granulomatosis. Sarcoid is a mimic of Wegener's granulomatosis, less common, but can look exactly the same. Less common causes of septal erosions. The major infection that we associate with septal erosion is Klebsiella. Uh, we've talked about how aggressive invasive fungal sinusitis can erode through any of the bony contents of the nasal cavity, mucor famous for doing so. Borreliosis is a, a, an interesting occupational exposure. Uh, um, beryllium oxide is what coats the inside of incandescent light bulbs. And um, uh, people who work in junkyards where many of these have been broken open can breathe in the beryllium oxide. It causes a lung disease and also can uh, uh, cause erosions of uh, the septum. One really important one to remember is T-cell lymphoma. We normally think of lymphoma as causing a mass. It might erode or often remodel underlying bone, but it's usually mass-like. T-cell lymphomas, particular types of T-cell lymphoma, may have only superficial spread and thus may not form a discrete mass. You may only see the erosions of the underlying bone and not see the mass itself. This is equivalent to the skin disease mycosis fungoides, terrible name, which is actually a T-cell lymphoma with superficial spread along the skin. You can similarly get superficial spread along the mucosa that may appear radiologically just as a septal erosion. This is critical. When you see a patient with septal erosions and they don't have an explanatory history like one of these other things, you need to suggest that it might be T-cell lymphoma and the patient should undergo biopsy so that we can ensure what's going on. Sometimes they know what's going on. This patient's known drug abuser, but if they don't have an explanatory history, you have to biopsy to exclude T-cell lymphoma. There is a historical entity called lethal midline granuloma. You may still see this in some textbooks. Uh, uh, pathologists now think there is no such thing, and all of these cases were misclassified Wegener's granulomatosis or T-cell lymphoma. Here's an example of what cocaine inhalation looks like. The septum is just missing from here to here. This can be a subtle finding. It's hard to see what isn't there. You've got to be looking for septal erosions. Uh, it's not only cocaine that can do this. Other inhaled products, particularly Percocet, in association with the recent opioid epidemic, uh, can cause erosion of nasal contents. Exactly the same appearance. Here's an example of Wegener's granulomatosis. You can see loss of the intra, intranasal contents, uh, particularly truncation of the inferior turbinate and erosions through the walls of the sinuses. Sarcoid can look just like Wegener's gran granulomatosis. In this case, it's predominantly affecting the ethmoid air cells, but you can also see truncation of the uh, inferior turbinate. New differential diagnosis. What about the when you have complete opacification of all the paranasal sinuses? What does that? There's really two diseases that cause complete opacification of the sinuses. Sinonasal polyposis and cystic fibrosis. The polyps because they obstruct outflow and cystic fibrosis because the secretions are too thick to move with the cilia. How can you tell these apart? Usually cystic fibrosis affects the paranasal sinuses, but you still have gas in most of the nasal cavity. Sinonasal polyposis usually completely fills both the nasal cavity and the sinuses. Okay, it's time for the take home points on the pathology of the paranasal sinuses. If you see a fluid level, that's acute bacterial sinusitis. Even if it doesn't have froth, even if it doesn't have mucosal thickening, a fluid level is acute bacterial sinusitis. The one mimic that you need to be wary of is intubated patients. Intubated patients may have fluid levels without superinfection. Of course, you can't exclude superinfection in those patients, but they can have sterile effusions in their sinuses. There are three types of fungal sinusitis, invasive, allergic, and mycetomas. Those correspond to three different immune statuses.
Malignancies of the paranasal sinuses can be hard to differentiate from one another. Sometimes you get lucky and you get a specific radiologic finding, but often you've just got to wait for the biopsy. Fibrosseous lesions can be hard to differentiate from one another, but if you know some particular tri tricks, you can usually come to a specific diagnosis. Thankfully, fibrosseous lesions are benign and usually do not cause surgical problems in the skull base. Sometimes fibrous dysplasia clamps down on one of the foramina, but usually fibrosseous, the differentiation of fibrosseous lesions is not critical uh, to, the, to the care of the patient. And that concludes our lecture on imaging of the paranasal sinuses.